everything that we do in there is our action and what what we do before that itself there is the world has a perception of who we are and what we are doing so for example we all have a particular conception of say the bhagavad gita so now there is a particular conception of that in india there is a particular conception of that in the west now we could say most people may not even know about the bhagavad gita that's possibly true but some some of them do know so now broadly in philosophy this is a big question that say if this is the substance and then we have the let me put it another way here rightly see we have a particular conception of the substance okay why is it okay so okay put it this way i have a so i have a particular conception of the substance and you have a particular conception of the substance mm -hmm. and in some ways when we say that we are arriving at truth truth is basically a process of increasing alignment between conception and reality or conception and substance hmm so we can't really know everything completely or any even anything completely but if our it's more and more aligned the better it is so if i'm going to philosophical let me know i'll make it a little more philosophical then <laughs> <laughs> no i'm thinking i'm thinking of like an elephant and like if a, there's like um like somebody staring at the elephant's tail and somebody staring at the elephant's leg and they're each describing what an elephant is based off of that vantage point and then when they both zoom out they see the whole thing and they see that it's the same but in the meantime when they're so zoomed in on that particular body part that's what they're convinced is an elephant is that kind of what you're explaining yeah good example yes it's a, mm, i don't know whether to be annoyed or pleased i thought i <laughs> i thought i was making a profound concept and you made it so simple <laughs> no it's great it's, it's, no mm, so it's good i think very nice so the point is that you could say there is in this particular there is indian popular culture and then there is western popular culture and so what you drew here is the gita and you're saying that western popular culture understands it maybe a little bit differently than indian popular culture yes i think the conception of the prominent image is different and this clash of conceptions actually came out in this this blockbuster movie oppenheimer that is currently doing quite well in india as well as in the west hmm? incidentally so this controversy is over the gita and yes, and what it's, it is and what it isn't over the in the oppenheimer movie the depiction of the gita mm so the controversy is over that so by the way mm, it seems that so you you have i'll go into the movie soon that's the idea of popular culture but veda you have been unusually silent mm. i'm i'm quite intrigued about this movie that I, i've never seen and everyone is talking about it so i'm 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 wondering uh, yeah, okay. i'm happy to see this movie through your eyes so i don't have to watch it oh okay so i can become your movie watcher Yes. <laughs> Did you see this movie, CC? See, I am much. I'm much more of a verbal person than a visual person. If you give me a choice between watching a movie and reading the review of a movie, I would much more prefer reading the review. So I have read many reviews of the movie. I saw some scenes from it, and I've read a lot about Oppenheimer before. So that's why when I I comment on my social media on movies, I don't say, I say specifically say what I'm offering is not a review of the movie. i'm offering more of reflections on the movie mm -hmm. so yeah so i okay. know more or less the storyline of the movie and uh, okay so i'll talk about it 
I'll give some introduction and then we can discuss the controversy. So maybe most of us, maybe some of us haven't seen the movie. So you have to give us a little. Okay. Yeah, sure. So Oppenheimer, so Oppenheimer, this is more or less like a biography of or biography's life. So Oppenheimer is known, the scientist known as the father of the atomic bomb. So he, he was the person who led the research in what is known as the Manhattan Project. So this project started when rumors started surfacing among the allies that uh, Hitler was on the verge of developing some atom bombs. And that's when Einstein and some other scientists wrote to Eisenhower, the American president, saying that America needs to develop these weapons. So all this is depicted in the movie. The movie is by Christopher, uh, directed by Christopher Nolan, who is known to be like a little bit of abstruse director. So the timeline is uh, wavering. It goes backward and forward. So, but anyway, the broad storyline is it describes how mm, the movie describes how Oppenheimer came to lead the project. So basically, the key part is roughly 1943 to 45. So 43 more or less the project started. And 45, the project ended in the sense that the atom bomb was first tried out in, in New Mexico in what was called as a Trinity test. And then it was actually dropped in Japan, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And now after that, there are some more incidents also described in the movie. And some movies that incidents are described after that, or before that also, his previous life. So now, when he, he developed the atom bomb, he, it was especially in 19, when that it was tested, uh, Mexico testing was done. That's the time he quoted from the Bhagavad Gita, a verse, 11.32. This verse basically says, Kalos mi time I am, the destroyer of the worlds. The translation he had was, uh, death I have become. Now, this is not the literal translation, but this is a translation that, Oppenheimer had, a destroyer of the worlds. And this is what he quoted. Now, this was not the only time Oppenheimer quoted the Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> it seems that when he was studying science, he was fascinated by East and Eastern wisdom. And in fact, in his university, he just he learned Sanskrit so that he could study the Gita and a few other Sanskrit books in their original language. And he later on said that Gita is one of the top 10 influencers in his life, the books that influenced him the most. Mm. He's also quoted to have said that the Gita is the most beautiful philosophical song ever written in uh, human history. Mm. So he did quote it many times. And uh, now in this particular context, when he quoted the Gita, he it's a significant that he's quoted this verse so apart from this also he seems to have uh, talked about the gita to a few people uh, when i think uh, uh, fdr roosevelt passed away at his memorial he gave him the in the memorial he distributed gitas to people but let's look specifically at this comment which he made what was his thinking when he quoted this particular verse from the Gita? So that's the history of his relationship with the Gita. And he is depicted as having quoted the Gita when the when the test explosion succeeds. So should I go ahead or you want to add this something? Is good. Okay. Mm, so now basically the ethics were quite perplexing, agonizing in fact, is developing this atom bomb because they all knew, scientists knew how much destructive power would be unleashed by this. And yet, the fact was that uh, now the development of the atom bomb, developing the bomb, would lead to destruction but not developing it could lead to maybe greater destruction because 
uh, if a person like Hitler got his hands on it, then he as a the tyrant might make a, might actually use it for far greater harm to the world. So, in many ways, at the start of the Bhagavad Gita, this was Arjuna's dilemma. Also, now Arjuna did not want to fight the war. So, fighting would mean death, death for at a large scale, but not fighting could we well mean greater damage, greater destruction, greater death. Why? Because in that particular case for Arjuna, if he didn't fight, there would be there, the opposite side where people who were tyrants, people who were exploiters, abusers, they had done many ethically shocking things, reprehensible things, and they would continue to do that. In fact, if they won this war, then there would be nobody to challenge them after this. And thus, it was a painful situation. And in this painful situation, it is in the Gita Krishna, the speaker of the Gita, the, the, the source of the wisdom of the Gita, who is also considered the divine descended on the world. He is speaking that this destruction is a part of the divine plan. So, that now these people, everybody gets the view of their actions and these people, they are just trying to die. So I have come as destruction, as the, as the destructive agent over here. So the, the verse itself was spoken for giving solace to Arjuna. I don't think you are personally responsible for this. It is actually they by their own deeds. It's like suppose a criminal is has done such terrible crimes that that person is being tried and sentenced to death. Now the executor has to administer the capital punishment. So the executor doesn't have to feel guilty. So that was the idea. So did Oppenheimer think that... Can we talk about... Yeah, let me complete this point. Did Oppenheimer think that you know, maybe his situation was similar? Uh, well, we will talk about the ethical lines of the Second World War a little later. They're not that black and white, certainly. But the point was that he also felt that he had that when this destructive power was unleashed, so the destructive power basically, the destructive power basically was a reminder of something greater, reminder of divinity. Now, whether it is a personal divinity, whether a specific divinity, that's a different question. But the destructive power was a reminder of divinity. So there was, I'll conclude with one quick point. Now, there is this feeling of awe when we encounter something far bigger than ourselves. Now that sense of awe originally led to this word called awesome. Although now the word awesome is just used very cheaply for anything that is good, enjoyable, excellent. The party was awesome, the food was awesome, like that we use it. But originally it is, the, that was the meaning, of the, the meaning of awesome was something which is which has a positive emotion associated with something spectacular, far greater than ourselves. And similarly, there's another word which also has lost its original meaning, that's awful. Awful in the past was also, it, it didn't have that, now this connotation is dreadful. It's awful, it's painful, it's horrible. But again, in the past, the word aw as awful meant that something very great that also fills us with a sense of awe, but in this case, negatively. So for example, if you go to the Himalayan mountains and stand at the, at, the, at the base of a mountain and look up at the majestic peaks, that would be something awesome. Hmm? On the other hand, if we see, say, a storm, say a cyclone has wrecked havoc in a city, and we see the destruction that's awful, now, if that destruction is of course awful in the sense of being dreadful, but just seeing the sheer power that could, that could just throw away cars and knock down buildings and knock over giant trees, that fills us with a sense of awe. So Arjuna had a similar feeling. So this, this feeling of both the senses of awe were present in Arjuna when he saw 
the majestic form of destruction majestic what is called as the universal form displayed by Arj by krishna in the bhagavad gita and we could say that to some extent on seeing the atom bomb exploding not in japan but before that in the test in the new mexico desert oppenheimer also felt similar emotions he says that when the bomb exploded some of some of the scientists laughed some of them cried some of them were left speechless so that's basically the idea of seeing some making sense of such a mind numbing power for making sense of that he found the bhagavad gita's wisdom as a resource well that's resource for what though sorry resource for what resource resource for making sense now whether he made the sense that he made was generally what happens for us in life if you consider mm, pain or distress it's always bad but what is especially worse is meaningless pain mm? somebody is injured it's painful but somebody is say injured because they take a bullet on the battlefield mm? that is meaningful pain and that is that is much more bearable it's pain but it's bearable and if somebody is just training to fight in a war and there's a freak accident and some bullet gun goes off and they are hit by a bullet that's meaningless pain so when you talk about bearing pain on a scale it is much more bearable if it is meaningful and is far less bearable if it is meaningless so basically wisdom like the wisdom of the bhagavad gita helps us to make sense of the situations in our life and he found some resource in the wisdom of the bhagavad gita to make sense of the choices that he was facing and the decisions he made in those choices so overall he was like a well-intentioned person uh let's say that's a good question because uh, he did see what happened was by the time 1945 if you consider timeline in 1945 by the time the the atom bomb was developed germany had already surrendered before that so in one sense there was no need to develop the weapon now after that the bombs were dropped in hiroshima and nagasaki and then japan surrendered now historians are divided whether how long the war would have gone on if uh, the if the if america had not used the atom bomb but in general the consensus is that that maybe the use of the atom bomb was unnecessary on japan well wait he's not responsible for the decision No, no, that's what I said. That's, that's, I'm, I'm, coming to, I'm coming to that point, of course. So he so, made the weapon, and he did say to Roosevelt that you know, I have blood on my hands, and Roosevelt said that no, if there's any blood, it's on my hands. And after that, Roosevelt was annoyed, and he said that you know he's such a crybaby. Don't bring him in front of me ever again. He says we have to make decisions like this. So almost all the scientists, even Einstein, had great regrets. not about so much about the development of the atom bomb as the deployment of the atom bomb and then later Can we on we talk about this yeah so uh, I, I, this is what about. i wanted to talk about earlier when you were making the point of okay go ahead please him well, you drew that you said that he was making um he was creating the atom bomb uh if you go e- up even more yeah to uh prevent destruction almost like yes the atom bomb would create destruction if used but if but not creating it could potentially cause more destruction and i just thought this was really interesting i have a nuclear engineering background and something i really liked about nuclear science or when i got into it it was I, what i thought i thought it was a misunderstood energy that could be used for good and i worked for a contractor of the navy designing nuclear submarines not nuclear weapons but nuclear submarines they're powered they're powered by nuclear power and um 
and now I'm not doing that anymore. But as you were talking about that, I want I was curious as to your opinion as to that synopsis, that this conclusion that creating a creating a bomb could be destruction could be destructive, but not creating it could be more destruction, like destructive. Like what's your opinion about that? Logic. You should hear the political opinion. They say it's a deterrent that if we have a nuclear weapon, everyone will leave us alone. Yeah, I think that's the rationale. Yeah, deterrence is a very important principle to consider. Now I live in India. Okay, I cannot draw a very good map of India, but if you consider this is India, then this is above it is much bigger is China. Next to India is Pakistan. Now there have been several wars between India, Pakistan, and China. Hmm? The wars happened primarily in 1960s to 1980s. Mm -hmm. But in the 1980s and 1990s especially, all three countries developed nu nuclear weapons. Now, nuclear weapons are uh, are far worse than atom atomic weapons also. Now, after that, there has been no war. Now, it doesn't mean that there are no tensions. There are tensions, there are hostilities, there is cross-border terrorism. But nothing has broken out to the level of an outright war. So does deterrence work? Well, I would say it does work. Now, how much deterrence is required for something to work? It's difficult to say. You know, you say, for example, in the current war, Ukraine had its nuclear weapons. Ukraine gave up its stockpile. You know, maybe Russia wouldn't have attacked um, Ukraine, Ukraine if it had nuclear weapons. Now, of course, you can also say the other way that although Russia has had nuclear weapons, and although, in fact, it has the biggest stockpile of nuclear weapons, in the world, it has not used it, although the war has not gone the way it wanted. It has not won it as fast as it thought it would win it. It has not used nuclear weapons. So that's a quick political synopsis, a geopolitical historical synopsis. So is deterrence required? Well, if we live in a world with uh, harsh realities, in fact, the Bhagavad Gita is spoken to Arjuna, who I put it as he's a good person with no good choices, no good options. Fighting is a terrible option, but not fighting is a more terrible option. Sometimes life presents us with such situations only. Now, was the American use of the nuclear weapon? Of the atom bomb desirable or essential certainly not desirable essential it's difficult to say that but the more and more scholars are historians are veering toward the idea that it may not have been necessary it did bring the war to an end and as far as we know now weapons of there are other weapons of mass destruction like chemical weapons and others they have been used but nuclear weapons or atom atomic weapons have not been used thereafter so if you were the one making that call back when he was designing it, would have you had him keep designing it and do it? Or would have you had him stop and not create it? Well, you cannot really uh, put the Jenny back in the bottle. You know that story. You have Jenny in the bottle, you open the, open the bottle, Jenny comes out. So technology is like that Jenny which has come out of the bottle. There's no putting it back in. You just have to make the best of a bad bargain. So if he had not made it, somebody else would have made it. Now, would you have been able to stop others from doing it? We don't know. And so it's a, it's a difficult decision. In the First World War, there were many scientists. In, see, generally, before the First World War or till the First World War, uh, war was primarily limited to the borders. So if this is country one, this is country two. So this would be the domain of the war. Where one country intrudes into other countries bond and they fight over there. But this was war historically. But toward the end of the first world war, basically airplanes started really taking off. Air travel and airplanes became much, much bigger. And that meant that with fighter planes, you could just zoom in, drop a bomb and come out. So war was no longer limited to planes. 
and that sorry no longer limited to the borders and that is something which is unprecedented so fighter planes you could just drop bombs so i would say that um, at least in the history of india there are even, there are investor historians megasthenes was a greek who wrote a book called indica and he says that how in war in india it was a, a meticulous principle meticulously followed principle that there were no civilians targeted during wars like if we consider the war that the bhagavad gita is describing the kurukshetra war it, it was decided the war, both the parties decided that we will fight at a particular place and we will follow certain course so there were no civilian targets so in one sense didn't they all like get together at night too and hang out like they'd fight during the day but then at night they were like cool with each yeah, other yeah it was it was almost like a sports you know sports is a like a test of strength and skill so it was like that like if you have a sports match if there's a cricket match you know you have a bitter fight sometimes on the sports field but after that you come out and you may chat together you may have lunch together you may have dinner together so now i don't say that it was like that in recent okay. years but the point was there were no civilian casualties and one thing is certainly true that <coughs> and hiroshima and nagasaki were chosen as targets for dropping the bombs and they were not that way major military bases and the number of civilians there were huge so the act of dropping the bomb there was certainly something which is deeply questionable and deeply troubling this is an interesting point in itself that like back in the day there's this code of ethics that people follow in fighting which now is like pretty much thrown out the window. Yeah, it only like that. highlights the danger of creating more destructive weapons because the way that we're fighting it's not really we're not really following a set code of ethics. It's really people it's really a free for all in a lot of ways. Oh yeah, in fact the terrorism is exactly opposite of how the war was meant to be. the so terrorism war is meant to target soldiers terrorism targets specifically civilians <coughs> traditionally when war was fought at least in the past not in the recent past but in the distant past in india it would be one soldier one one soldier would not hit the other soldier unless that person was armed it is not always followed but that was the that was the code that was there in the in the bhagavad gita war that is described now if you consider specialize in art- attacking people who are unarmed and not only that there are people who are alert so if the enemy is sleeping and then you attack them in their sleep that's considered brutal that's considered barbaric but here it is people are just going along their normal lives and suddenly a bomb explodes and people are killed so that is horrendous so that that's unfortunate actually but this kind of goes this kind of goes along with the clip we have of you on our instagram with the um what is it misguided no something missiles with misguided men like the problem is that we yeah have we have really that. destructive technology in the hands yeah what was that caption yeah, we have guided missiles and misguided men Yeah, guided missiles. So when I asked you that question about what have you made that decision to make that destructive technology, it's kind of an example of that where it may not necessarily be the destructive technology that's as much of a problem as the misguided use of it. Yes. Good point. You know, what we can try to do is we cannot stop having guided missiles, but that's actually not that's a quote from martin luther king he said our scientific power has outrun our spiritual power we have guided missiles and <clears throat> misguided men so now we cannot stop the fact that there are going to be guided missiles but what we can do is we can try to provide inner guidance more and more and we can help people develop the inner resources by which they can have self greater level of self restraint so in one sense you know science can help us to guide missiles but we need spirituality to guide human beings 
we have discussed mm-hmm. this earlier wow. you know science is the study of matter spirituality is the study of what matters what is how important in life that is what spirituality studies and we need this study also it's yeah, a very yeah so we really want to yeah go ahead if we really want to optimize this equation then we have to grow both of them um at the same time or it creates a disbalance or disharmony and that's where destruction can come in this is why I switch this is why I switch from the right side over to the left <laughs> side yeah it's a good example good point i would say this was also one of the reasons why i did the same thing and when i was studying uh, my 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 dream was to become an astrophysicist and uh, oh, i didn't know that uh, yeah <laughs> awesome. okay, i i had many dreams <laughs> that was one of my dreams when i was studying in college so as i was studying in a place called pune and pune has one of india's top space research institutes called ayuka so i'd gone there met several scientists there and uh, i used i had this naive kind of idea that science is a pursuit of higher wisdom and is a pursuit of higher happiness and the pursuit of higher meaning in life and there's definitely a part of that i had a biography of a lot of scientists but then i went to the sci- when i went to meet some scientists over there maybe i i mean not maybe i was actually naive but i saw that these scientists were the time that they look forward to i did some the- project work with them the, the time that they really look forward to was not the scientific research that they were doing but after that when they would go to a bar and hang out and drink and smoke and i said if you are really getting happiness in science why do you need to why do you are so i was so enthusiastic about drinking and smoking the things that everyone else is doing so no i didn't uh, it's not so much that i was uh, judging them for judging the habits of drinking and smoking there and all the habits but there are indulgences which are there in human society but with my conception of science as a pursuit of higher wisdom higher happiness higher fulfillment that was completely shattered by that so you know okay maybe there's, there's not this high, the scientific knowledge really doesn't there must be something missing in this happiness and these were brilliant scientists they were among the best scientists in india at that time so that's why i started thinking where do you really find happiness so that's where i started exploring spirit that's one of the reasons why i started exploring spirituality that's me see see i feel like i want to give you a high five across the uh, camera <laughs> i felt the same way yeah let's accept it mm <laughs> <laughs> So now can I go into my controversy part? Mm. Mm-hmm. Are you want to Please. discuss? Please. Oh, Vedo, do you have anything to add to this? You're kind of quiet. I'm waiting to see how CC gets controversial. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically I commented on this movie and I said that I was up for an I told that I have not watched the movie but I comment I'm not commenting on the movie per se I'm commenting on why Oppenheimer quoted the Bhagavad Gita. But then after that on my YouTube and my personally on my WhatsApp and other places I started getting messages what is your comment about the nude scene in the movie. So now I had no idea there was nude scene and then I I looked at the rating it is adult rating so so apparently there's nudity over there. But what was what really irked Indians uh, especially Indian Hindus was that there's a scene where Oppenheimer is with his mistress and they are being physically intimate and while they are doing that she looks around she sees a library and so she just picks up a book and she says a sanskrit book can you read this so then apparently while she while she is pleasuring him he opens the book and he starts reading the sanskrit and she is very impressed and she pleasures him more because of that so this triggered and because the bhagavad gita is considered to be a holy book and why would such a holy book be depicted in such a situation if they wanted to depict how clever he was how much he was fluent in sanskrit he could have done they could have done any other way if they wanted to depict that maybe he was using his cleverness to impress and attract women they could have done that also in some other way in fact uh, 
the version of the movie that was released in america had many more explicit scenes than the version of the movie that was released in india so there were some scenes that were cut out and yet this but when the movie was released in india and yet this scene was kept so the anger in india was not just towards uh, the movie makers but it was also towards the indian censor board why didn't it not not consider was towards the what oh the censoring the censor board of india that why did it not consider this and eliminate uh, have this removed so so that's what ha happened and uh, as of now those scenes have not been removed and the storm has in at least in india died down to some extent in america even there are other significant demographic of american indians it seems that there was not that much of a opposition now the now as far as i could find out none of these biographies of oppenheimer mention that some that an actual incident like this happened uh, but so so first of all it's not historically true secondly is it artistic like are there some artistic creativity is it artistically necessary that's the art, that's the director's decision but is it artistically necessary to means to have that scene is it artistically necessary that's the art director's decision but to have that scene and have the bhagavad gita recited at that time that is what is a provocative decision so that's what has irked people and uh, so my first video seemed to be supporting the movie i didn't specifically support the movie but just explaining how why or how open hammer quoted the bhagavad gita but then the so that led to the issue that am i supporting the depiction of nudity like that nudity while reciting the bhagavad gita so then i made a second video saying that you know this is unfortunate this is um, this is insensitive it is uh, distressing and it's discordant so that that also involves some amount of feedback so then some devotees some of my friends from america they pushed back and said that you know why are you such a what is the word why are you such a prude they said that for so many people this is their first introduction to the bhagavad gita and as far as that's those kind of physical scenes of physical intimacy they are everywhere there in movies but for them those scenes they see now now anybody with the internet connection can get can see things like that so the fact that they are encountering the bhagavad gita is what is important they coming to know about the bhagavad gita they are hearing the bhagavad gita being quoted and that will trigger their inquisitiveness of the about the gita so that's a positive so why are you condemning the movie so i tried to say i am not at all condemning the movie i made two videos uh, and my comment was more on the gita and the fact that the gita is being quoted is appreciated but in this con context it was gratuitous it was provocative and uh, it was unfortunate so in uh, so from the american perspective there's a positive that's why i talked about the intersection of popular culture in different ways so in america the fact that the gita has come in the minds of people through this movie is itself positive but for indians gita is already in the mind so how the gita has come in the movie becomes a little more important and uh, there's also one more point that there are some western stereotypes about india so indian one of the most popular books from india in the west from ancient india in the west is the kama sutra which is often treated like the indian sex manual so the concern is that while the bhagavad gita is a philosophical book and the kama sutra is a very different kind of book so the lumping the bhagavad gita with the kama sutra can also perpetuate some stereotypes that was also a concern but that's the broad controversy hmm. so it's perceived in india is is like disrespectful yeah it's perceived as a insult in the name of art so the question is immediately raised that would something have been done with the bible or with the quran hmm? so the quran obviously it would not be done with the bible also it's unlikely although it might be done so this is also see what happens is the gita in the west is seen more as a book of wisdom in india it is seen 
as a book of religious veneration. It is a book of wisdom, but it's additionally a book of religious veneration. So, for example, say if somebody took uh, Plato's Republic and or they, uh, some other book like that, and they showed that in a scene like this, that is a book of wisdom. And a book of wisdom shown like this may not be the most appropriate, but it's not inflammatory. It's not provocative. So, but I said if the Bible or Quran were sound like that, that would definitely be provocative. So the Gita is different things for different people. And the fact that the Gita is a book of religious veneration for a significant number of people in the world is not something which uh, should have been overlooked by the movie makers. So till now, as far as I've seen, they have not made, neither Christopher Nolan or anyone else has made any statement about it. But that was a t controversy that came up, at least for a short while. Mm. Mm. Well, I feel like I could see both sides of that. I feel like I can understand how people would perceive it as disrespectful and be kind of offended. You can also see how maybe Western people would say, well, I mean, it's better than not ever hearing about the Gita, at least. And and it's also a little bit of a sign of how degraded our society is in a way that we need something like that, like something so provocative as, as a sex scene where the Gita is spoken to spark people's interests. I mean, that's a little bit of a testament to our degradation, but at the same time, it's reality. So if that's what's sparking people's interest and making them open it, and almost like a could be a launching pad to a deeper study and realization. Is it a positive thing? Could it be a positive thing? Maybe. Yeah, as I said, I'm, in principle, I feel that the fact that the Gita has been discussed is positive. At, uh, while we cannot have everything the way we want it to be in the world, but there are things which are which are unpalatable and there are things which are unbearable. So personally, I find this unpalatable. I don't find it unbearable that the Gita was uh, depicted in this way. But I understand those who find it unbearable. Mm. Did he pause? Did, I think you might have. I'm curious what you think too, Veda. I think everyone paused. <laughs> or sees, okay, now it's working. You know, this, this, this whole notion of using this wisdom texts, it's, it's, it's very distasteful, right? And I also feel it's very hypocritical because it seems like the Western media, they hammer down on intolerance in India and in the, 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 the Indian people and this right wing, they have all this terminologies that they use. And yet at the same time, they're quite happy to touch them by misusing a very sacred book that hurts the sentiments of billions of people. So I find these people quite uh, hypocritical, this whole society of, you know, and trying to impose their personal uh, their personal uh, morality and ethics onto the world as being absolute because they have control over the media. I find it quite distasteful. And I find the sages in India, even the general people are extremely tolerant, extremely tolerant. If this were to happen to any other book, there'll be a global revolution. But imagine 1.4 billion people, there's billions of Hindus around the world. And then, you know, they're peaceful, they understand, they're giving everyone the benefit of the doubt. 
yet at the same time, they will be the ones to be uh, talked of being intolerant. So sometimes I feel this kind of uh, mindset that we have in the world is really ignorance. You know, it's really ignorant people, insensitive. And so therefore, I think that, I mean, I don't have a solution, but yet I feel that somehow if there was more awareness and they would really, really study the Gita, they would have a little bit more respect for it. And if people had a little bit more respect for uh, we respect people that are looking towards the East for solutions. Why don't, why don't we try to respect the people and try to understand them a little bit before we try to, you know, intentionally or unintentionally hurt their sentiments. I think it's just, it's sad. You know? And this is how we divide people. And and unfortunately, even though I haven't seen this movie, I'm sure, you know, there is a underlining message that they want to give. Every movie has a message. And it seems like this message possibly, I don't know if it's intentional or unintentional. There's a there's a there's possibly this intent to somehow rile up a certain section of the community. And that's, is distasteful. Mm, yeah, I agree. I, I feel that, as I said, that it was not necessary. The movie stands on its own merit. It attracts own people. And there is this phenomena that sometimes some movie directors, uh, movie producers, you could not necessarily directors, who are the movie makers, they sometimes try to manufacture a controversy that more people will see it. And it's not an uncommon strategy. But uh, this movie has a excellent director, a well-reputed director. It has a big, big uh, cast of, uh, again, well, well-known actors. It has, uh, Oppenheimer has been an interesting figure in Western history. So it could stand on its own merit. It did not need to do this. And that's why the manufacturing, the controversy, that's unfortunate. Now, there is a feeling in India that uh, there's a concerted attempt to demonize India and uh, demonize everything Indian. And this is a part of that. So the idea, for example, is that in the Western, not necessarily in the in the yoga circles per se, but in the Western academia, in the Western mainstream media. What the way it is portrayed is that 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 now if you see from India, India has been the source of yoga, India has been the source of ahimsa. Ahimsa is nonviolence. And uh, India that that's a Buddha, that's vegetarianism. Which, which results from that, and that is now led to veganism. But the way it is portrayed is that all these, they come. Mm. Now, India also, unfortunately, also had the caste system, mm, which has been quite discriminatory. So, what happens is that the caste system is attributed to Hinduism, and the yoga, ahimsa, and vegetarianism, they are attributed to, to pre Hindu religion or to Buddhism. So the idea is that, okay, or the, what is there is, what India does is worship of cows, which is seen as incomprehensible, which is seen as foolish, just primitive. So there is this overall tendency to take the good that has come from India and culturally appropriate it or ascribe it to something other than the main religion of India. Now, whether this was a part of it, this whole thing is called as cultural appropriation. 
Now, Christopher Nolan, from what I read, he doesn't have any history of doing that. So whether he, whether he was a part of that agenda, I don't know. But that is also a part of the bigger picture, which which riles some people. And uh, hopefully the outcry over this will will prevent similar things from occurring in the future. But what you said, Veda, is true that whenever there is any even a protest mentioned about this, the result is that that immediately Hindus, Hindus are branded as right wing extremists, intolerant. But actually, they said they've been tolerating quite a bit. And eventually, everybody's tolerance has its limits. That's what has happened at present. You know, what I liked about what Veda said when he said it was hypocritical, you know, you think about how much sensitivity we try to have in our own cultures and societies with people. Even, even we talked about a lot of the things on the show here, like genders and just different things that we that it's so politically correct to have so much sensitivity. But then we we have so little sensitivity for another culture. And which yeah, on like point. a really it's. It's interesting how we almost like limit the scope of our sensitivity. I don't know if that's out of ignorance or just out of this is this is what and who we respect. And this is this is what we're going to say is OK to to cross the line on. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's concluding point. Uh, sorry, what did you say, Vena? We have taken being the creator minus morale. Yeah, that's a little bit scary. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. So I'll conclude with one point which I have emphasized to those who ask me this question is that it is, see, whenever something whenever something offensive happens, offensive event is there, something which you feel is insulting, disturbing. So at that time, if you're considering evaluating it. So broadly, we could say that the causes can range from ignorance. They just didn't know it was in, in e offensive. It could be incompetence. It was their job to know and they didn't find it. They didn't do that job properly. Or it could be malevolence. Where they, they are just evil people out to offend. Now, in general, I recommend that we start with this explanation. So this is the first explanation. Try to like say, give the benefit of the doubt. Don't assume that people are being malevolent. Then second is ignorant. Third is malevolent. So if we jump to the explanation that people who did this are malevolent, then that polarizes much more. And in general, in our life also, when somebody insults us, somebody disrespects us, if we are constantly jumping to the conclusion that people out there are malevolent, then that's that's actually if you consider from the perspective of mental health, this is is malefic. It is it is harmful. It is not beneficial. It's harmful for our mental health. So hopefully, that message registered for at least some people, and uh, the temperatures have gone down. So in this particular case, I would say that it it was incompetence at the least. It cannot be ignorance. No, okay. the a person who did such exhaustive research to make a movie like this, who that person would not know that the Gita is seen as a book of religious devotion, that seems stretching the limits of credibility, of not credibility, credulity. So it's unbelievable. So hopefully it is not malevol malevolent, it is just incom incompetent, and it won't be a chapter that is repeated in the future. Is incompetent in this context mean like they didn't understand the consequences of their actions or what? How would you define incompetence in this context? Yeah, they either didn't bother to do the research to know that the Gita is a book considered sacred by so many people or they didn't really care for the consequences. It's like, say, if a doctor prescribes a medicine. How's that different than ignorant, I guess? No, ignorance means, so I, I was giving the example to illustrate that point. If a doctor prescribes a medicine and that medicine ends up making the patient worse. 
and then we find out that's a, that's a side effect of the medicine. So now, if that side effect was never known, neither to doctor, nor to the patient, nor to the medical community, then we could say, okay, the doctor was ignorant. But if the doctor did not look at the case study of the patient properly, if the doctor did not keep in mind the, the various possible known side effects of that particular medication, the doctor administered the medicine, that would be incompetence. And the doctor deliberately wanted to harm the patient. And that would be malevolence. Okay, so ignorance would be like completely uninformed. Yeah. In, incompetence is like partially informed. Because they didn't care to know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is really interesting even for all of us too. When, when something happens to us or we feel like we've been offended to not automatically jump to three to kind of go through this, this process of ignorance, incompetence, and um, what's this word? Male malevent? How did you pronounce this? I'm so bad with oh, really? pronunciation of words. Oh my God. It's Malibus. like one of my, it's actually quite embarrassing <laughs> because I'm so bad at them. I can't remember how words go sometimes. Say it Malevo again. Malevolence. At least that's the way I think Malevolence. it is pronounced. Malevolence. 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 Okay. Like we have benevolence, malevolence. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I like that process that you just put out there. Thank you. Mm. So, Shiraz, whether do you want to say something concluding or should I summarize? We went a little over time today. Yeah, please summarize. Okay, it is malevolence. Malevolence. Mm -hmm. Malevolence. Malevolence. It's okay, so we discussed primarily about how there's an object and then there's a conception of the object and how they are different often. Object or substance. The substance. And then there's the conception of the substance and how our theme was how the Gita is the substance and how it is pursued differently in the West and in the in India. So that was the broad theme that we discussed, and within that, discussed Oppenheimer's movie and the history of him quoting the Gita, how the Gita helped him find meaning, some meaning amid the ethical dilemma and also the so it's like you had two good people who have Arjuna was a good person who had no good options and then also and there was the idea of sea divinity in destruction that is the two meanings of the word ow as awesome and awful so both of them are slightly are older meanings we see something far greater than ourselves and we feel filled with positivity, that's awesome. Or we feel filled with negativity. Then we discuss basically briefly the ethics of weapons of mass destruction. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> within that, the conclusion more or less was that we cannot stop science from weapons, weapons development from guiding missiles, but we can have spirituality getting guiding humans better. So science is the study of matters, spirituality is the study of what matters. And the last part we discussed was about Oh, I like that. <laughs> we talk about sensitivity and the controversy in India arose from two different conceptions of the Gita. The Gita is a book of wisdom and veneration. So it is good to assume it is distressing that the Gita was depicted during a sex scene, but it is, it is helpful to assume that that particular depiction was due to, due to more of either ignorance or incompetence rather than malevolence. So anything you want to add? Yeah, I think I elaborated science is the study of matter and spirituality is the study of what matters. 
I mentioned that and I was yeah, surprised. You didn't say that phrase though. That's the first time. No, I, I wrote it no, down. You mentioned it. Oh, yeah, did he? I was oh, surprised okay. that there was no reaction to that. It. So, <laughs> where did I say it? <laughs> I missed it. I would have reacted because that's awesome. That should be yeah, on our see. Instagram. <laughs> Brittany missed it too. Right. Science is the study of matter. Spirituality is the study of what matters. Ah, uh, that's good. That, that's great. Well, thank you so much for all of that, um, CC and, and Veda. That's, that's really appreciate all of your guys' wisdom and perspectives. Um, just a couple of announcements before we end here. If you haven't checked out our Instagram, please do Seekers Quest 108. And also on our Instagram and our bio, we have a button. You can check out our website and you can check out, um, we have a donor box there. So if you're getting something out of the podcast and you want to support us, uh, we do have some expenses. So it, it would be great if you wanted to pledge a monthly donation. If not, you could share our um, videos and our podcast to your social media and maybe we can grow our community, help us somehow in um, expanding um, this wisdom and knowledge and outreach. So thank you all. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you.